Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. You've got an interesting career as a writer because you've explored all sorts of things like, you know, you did a book to sell as human. You talk about motivation, your book Drive. What led you to, dis- to research and write about the science of timing when we do things? Well, I realized that I was making all kinds of timing decisions myself about what, literally about when to do things. So everything from when in the day should I work out, morning or evening? When should I abandon a project that's not working? All these kinds of when decisions. And I realized I was making them in a pretty haphazard way. And I wanted to make them in a better way. I started looking around for a book that would allow me to be more informed about how to make those decisions. That book, unfortunately, did not exist. So I had to write it. Um, so uh, I wrote this book largely because I wanted to read it because I wanted to make better timing decisions myself. Well, it's curious. You, you talk about this, you make this point in the book that when oftentimes we're trying to look at how to improve ourselves, we always look at the how or the what, and people never think about the when. Why do you think that is? You know, that's a great question. I'm not sure. For some reason, I, I, we've always given it short shrift. We've always taken questions of what should I do very seriously. We're, you know, understandably, I am too obsessed with learning and improvement. So we want to know how to do things better. We, we're very selective often about who we partner with. So the, the who. But I don't know. For some reason, the when question has been sitting at the kids' table and it really belongs at the grown-ups table. And there's a huge amount of evidence. Even if you look at something like time of day, just you know, probably the, one of the most powerful but, but relatively mundane issues of timing. When in the day should you do things? It turns out that, that time of day explains about 20% of the variance in how human beings perform on tasks that involve brain power. So, you know, 20%, I mean, that doesn't mean timing is everything, but it's a freaking big thing. Yeah, so let's get into that, because you look at timing from different perspectives, and the first part you look at is the timing that our bodies have, right? We have this natural yeah. clock. Tell us a bit about this natural clock, how it works, what's its, I mean, what's the average, what, what does it look like throughout the day? Well, it's great. It's a really, really great point, because so much of timing at a, on a daily level is biological, is uh, physical is scientific. If you if you look at certain units of time, seconds, hours, weeks, those are things human beings have completely made up. All right, they're not real. But a day is a real thing because we're on this planet that you know makes one spin around in in uh, in twenty four hours. And our bodies also have not just a single biological clock, but an array of biological clocks. Some people believe biological clocks in every cell, and that has a big effect on our mood and our performance. And the gist of it, without getting too knee deep in the, in the actual biology, is, is the following. That most of us progress through the day in three stages. We have a peak, a trough, and a recovery. A peak, a trough, and a recovery. Most of us progress in that order, peak, trough, recovery. About a fifth of us do it in the reverse order, recovery, trough, peak. But what the science tells us is that there's certain kinds of work we should do in the peak, certain kinds of work we should do in the trough, and certain kinds of work that we should do in the recovery. And if you simply reallocate what you do in these various time periods, you're going to perform at a much higher level. So what should you do during your peak? Okay, so the peak. The peak, again, which for most of us is the morning, basically the, the morning to, the, to around noon, one o'clock. What we should do there are analytic tasks. Those are tasks that require vigilance, keeping out distractions, heads down, focus. So, you know, you're writing a legal brief if you're a lawyer. You're auditing columns of figures. You are trying to, you know, find bugs in, in software. So heads down analytic work where you want to keep out distractions. That is best done during our peak. Now, the trough is, for almost everybody, the early to mid-afternoon. That's pretty much good for nothing. If you look at, <laughs> it's actually kind of frightening. I mean, some of these numbers that I uncovered were pretty uh, alarming. You have a much greater chance of anesthesia, errors, and surgery for surgeries that begin at three rather than at eight in the morning. Doctors and nurses much less likely to wash their hands in the mid-afternoon than earlier in the day. If you look at, and this is actually really blew me away, the most common time period for auto accidents is between four and six a.m. Not a big surprise. The second most common time, between two and four p.m., that trough, that midday trough. So the trough isn't good for much. What you're better off doing is your administrative work answering your email, you know, doing your TPS reports, whatever kind of nonsense that we have to fill our days with. And then the recovery is interesting because the recovery, again, which for most of us occurs in the 
early after, the late afternoon and early evening, that's a time when our mood is higher, but our mood is better than during the trough. But our vigilance isn't quite as great as during the peak. And that combination is actually really interesting because when we're slightly less vigilant, but in a somewhat elevated mood, we're pretty good at creative stuff. That's a good time for, for, for brainstorming sessions and things that require greater creativity where you actually want to let in a few distractions. And to the extent it's possible, if we can just alter our schedules a little bit, have a little bit more control over when we do what we do, people are going to be able to perform at a higher level with very little cost. Yeah, I've, I've done that with myself. Like sometimes I'll stay up really late to, to write sort of like the initial draft of something and then use the morning the next day to edit. Because I feel like if I try to write, create, like, you know, write in the morning, I tend to be nitpicky and I just backspace a lot and delete. No, that's not right. But if I just, if it's late at night, I just let it, let it rip. And I'm surprised what I can get out. Yeah, you're less inhibited. I happen to be, I happen to be a morning writer only because for me, writing is, it, it, it so rarely flows that I have to be, I have to shut out every kind of, you know, I, I, I'm so easily distracted that I have to go to my peak low distractibility period in order to get any writing done. So uh, you talk about in the book, these are the typical cycle is this peak trough recovery. And it starts in the morning, goes in the, what do you do if like you're a night owl? Is there such a thing yeah. as night owl? People say that I'm a night owl, but is that really a thing? Totally. It's a thing. It's a, it's actually, it's, it's an important thing. What a night owl is, is what there's a whole field of research called chronobiology. Chrono meaning clock, biology meaning study of life. And that is devoted to studying our daily, mostly daily biological rhythms. And each of us has what's known as a chronotype. That is our proclivity on how, you know, do we wake early, or have a lot of energy early and then fade as the day goes on? Or do we wake later in the day and need a lot more time to ramp up and actually hit our peak in the evening. And it's a pretty interesting area. What it shows is that there's some big, big differences based on age. Big differences based on age. That people between, say, 14 and 24 are generally very, very owly. It has to do with, uh, largely with hormones, that there's a period in a, often in a teenager's life that sometimes drives parents nuts where their teen is suddenly sleeping really late and staying up really late. That's not a sign of there being lazy people. It's a sign that their biology is changing in a marked way. So people between 14 and 24 are quite owly. But um, there are a, a decent number of people, you know, let's call it one-fifth of the population or so, that regardless of their age are actually um, – have evening chronotypes and they wake later and, and go to sleep later. And for those kinds of people, the, the general pattern is the opposite. So they want to do their recovery first thing in the morning. They want to you know, do the trough at the same time the trough is for everybody else. But they hit their peak for analytic work, for work that requires focus, diligence uh, later in the day. And I think one of the challenges is that, you know, the, the truth is the distribution is, is that some of us are larks really morning types. Some of us are, are owls, really evening types. The majority, the vast majority of people are somewhere in between. But most of the workplace is designed for people who are larks or in between. And it really disadvantages the one out of five of us who are night owls. So what do you do if you're a night owl and you work at a job that has the, you know, the lark schedule? Can you adjust? Is it possible to adjust your schedule? Do you go to your boss and say, well, look, hey, I have a chronotype that will allow me, <laughs> that'll allow me to perform better and this will help the bottom line? Is that the pitch? I think that's actually a good pitch, and I think that enlightened bosses will respect that. There's some, there's some research done. There's a very famous chronobiologist, named, or as famous as a chronobiologist can be, named Till Ronenberg, who has done some work with companies in Germany to help them adjust their schedules so that it fits people's chronotypes. And geez, not surprisingly, they have uh, fewer accidents greater job satisfaction, higher productivity. So I think that's one way to do I think that's one way to do it. And you have to pitch it in terms of what's in it for the boss, what's in it for the company to have this different kind of schedule. On the other hand, you know, you, ha I, you know, we have to be realistic that a lot of people can't simply dictate what their schedule is going to be. And so there there's some opportunity to work the margin. So let's take let's take night and let's take a night owl who has to go to a an 8:30 a.m. meeting. Now that's miserable for some of these people. Understandably, I have a lot of empathy for that. And yet there's a meeting at 8:30 and they still have to do their job and perform. 
what can they do? Well, there are a few things. Number one is that the night before, while they're in their peak, they should maybe make a list of what they want to accomplish at the meeting, what they need for that meeting. And so put basically a checklist so they don't space out in the fog of the morning. The other thing that, that we can do is there, there are ways to increase our focus and boost our mood. Uh, and a lot of those happen through various kinds of breaks. So what I would advise a night owl who's going to an 8.30 meeting is to, before you go into the meeting, you got your checklist, take a walk outside beforehand. There's a lot of good evidence that movement and, and nature can be very restorative. The other thing that actually is fairly restorative is doing a, a good deed for somebody. So maybe on your way into that meeting, if you stop at the local coffee place, you know, buy a cup of coffee for the person behind you. And you know, doing good boosts our mood a little bit. So there are some things we can do to, night owls can do to you know, work the margins of it. But I actually prefer that they do exactly what you suggested, which is go to their boss, explain what's going on, and put it in terms of the company's interest. Yeah. And you've also seen a movement with schools knowing, you know, recognizing that teenagers are, tend to be night owls, and they're you know, adjusting the school day, starting later and ending later. Absolutely. And, and that's a huge issue. And if you look at the effects of, of I mean, starting school for at 7.15 a.m. for teenagers is such an unbelievably bad idea. It, it goes against everything we know about science and indeed everything we know about chronobiology, at least. In fact, you have the American Academy of Pediatricians has issued a policy statement saying, Please, school districts of America, do not start school for teenagers before 8.30 in the morning. And yet, the average school start time in America is 8.03, which again goes to your earlier point about, hey, we're just not taking these when issues seriously enough. And then the schools that have adjusted, like they've seen an increase in test scores and things like that. I mean, just making that adjustment that that can do a lot because all these schools are like, you know, they're, they're strapped for cash. They, they think we got to hire more teachers. Like, just start your day later and that can do a lot. It does a huge amount. I mean, it's such a great, I mean, first of all, what, what it shows is that you, that, that starting the school later for teenagers, we're not talking about for little kids, but for teenagers, starting the school later for teenagers, the school districts that have done it have seen incredible results, higher test scores, lower dropout rates, some really interesting evidence about a reduction in teenage uh, auto accidents, which is, which is really important, reduced uh, depression, I mean, uh, reduced obesity. It's really quite extraordinary. And to your point, though, there is, there's a study out of, out of Wake Forest that showed that, or it's not out of Wake Forest, but out of the Wake County, North Carolina School District, that showed that this is actually a very cost-effective remedy that other things that, that school districts do to try to reduce the dropout rate or improve test scores, you know, end up being more costly and simply start school at nine. You know, don't start school for teenagers at 7, 24 a.m. All right. So our, our bodies have this daily clock, this peak trough recovery throughout the day. Does it have a similar rhythm throughout the week? Uh, yes and no. What you see is that when when people on, on weekends, typically people who work during the weekend have the weekends off, people who work during the weekend have the weekends off, they end up essentially rising, uh, uh, falling asleep and awakening true to their chronotype because they don't have to get up to an alarm clock. So, so, so figuring out what time you wake up and what time you go to sleep on weekends, which are, which are typically for people what are called free days, um, is a good way to figure out your, your chronotype. There's some other evidence to show, though, in, in terms of behavior change that we're more likely to engage in behavior change. Say, I'm going to finally go to the gym. I'm going to start a new diet. I'm going to buckle down at work. We're more likely to pursue that and succeed at it if we do that, say, on a Monday rather than a Thursday. It's something called the fresh start effect. So, it, And it goes beyond the week. It goes to we're more likely to succeed if we do it on the first of the month rather than the 14th of a month, if we do it on the day after a holiday rather than the day before a holiday. So, but again, a week is a made up thing. A week is not a natural phenomenon. It's just something that human beings c came up with to try to corral time. Gotcha. And, but how about seasons, right? That's not a made up thing, right? The, we go through different seasons. Oh no, not at all. That's for real because that's for real because, because we're, we're, the, we got, we're on this little ball moving around the sun. Right. So I mean, do the seasons affect our, you know, our performance? Like do we behave in a different way during the winter than we say during the summer? That's it. 
Yeah, it's a really interesting question, and some of the evidence on that is mixed. I was a little bit skittish about pulling the trigger because I wasn't sure about some of those things. One of the things that's really interesting, though, is that whether you're a night owl or a lark correlates to the season in which you're born, if you can believe that. So the season in which you're born seems to have a uh, seems to have an effect on what your eventual adult chronotype is going to be, which is kind of peculiar. That is weird. Okay, so we got this this rhythm throughout the day, and there's things we can do to leverage that or work in the margins of that. You mentioned this fresh start stuff, and you talk about this in the book, a section about, temp, you call them temporal landmarks. Yeah. Monday is a temporal landmark. You know, holidays can be temporal landmarks. Tell, tell us a little bit more about this idea of temporal landmarks and how we can use those to boost our performance. Yeah, so that's not temporal landmarks isn't isn't my term. It's a term that from some of the mostly social psychologists who have studied some of these issues. And what it is is this: it's a really important. I, I think it's a really important concept. That is, there's certain dates, and and here we're talking about days of the year. There's certain days of the year that operate as landmarks in the same way that certain settings, certain buildings, or certain parks or whatever operate as physical landmarks and that that is that let's say you're trying you know you're trying to drive to my house and i say look for there's a certain i I live in washington dc and there's a restaurant near my house that everybody seems to know about called cactus cantina okay that's like the landmark to say hey you're close to my house and so what will happen is people will drive to my house they probably if i were to ask them what what did you pass by they have probably have no idea what they passed by But as soon as they see Cactus Cantina, they're like, oh, 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 I know, you know. So it's a landmark that gets us to do two things. Number one, slow down and pay attention. Uh, Number two, it has this really peculiar effect on the way we account for time in our heads. That is, we have a form of, of temporal accounting too. So on certain dates, we feel like we're opening a fresh ledger in the same way a business would open a fresh ledger at the beginning of a fiscal year or at the beginning of a new quarter. We say, oh, you know what? I was a lazy, I, I was a lazy slob during the month of March, but on the first day of April, I'm opening a fresh ledger and making a fresh start. So, and those end up being like the dates that I talked about. So Mondays are fresh start dates. The day after your birthday is a good fresh start date. The day after a federal holiday, the first day of a semester, the first day back from vacation, that there are a bunch of dates that have this, that operate like that, those physical landmarks. Again, they get us to slow down, pay attention and open up a fresh ledger. Right. And right now it's, yesterday was New Year's Day for for us. And uh, that's a great landmark day that people take advantage of. That is the king of fresh start days. Right. Uh, And it's one reason why we have, you know, it's one reason, it's the, it's the thinking behind New Year's resolutions. Okay. I was a complete slob during 2017, but in 2018, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to have a vegan diet and go to the gym three times a day. Yeah. So besides uh, these temporal landmarks and this rhythm throughout the day that we have, you, you also discuss the research behind how when we start things can have a huge impact on the outcome, whether it's success or failure. So can you give us some examples of when starting things can determine the outcome of something. We're going to take a quick break for your word from our sponsors. All right, we are protein bar connoisseurs here in the McKay household. we got a drawer that's just full of them, always trying new ones. And the one we're really digging right now is RX Bar. It's a whole food protein bar made with a few simple clean ingredients, which all serve a purpose, egg whites for protein, dates to bind, nuts for texture. In the interest of full transparency, all the core ingredients are labeled right on the front of the package. They're great for breakfast on the go, a snack at the office to throw in your bag when you go out for a hike. And they got 11 delicious flavor varieties. And they're all gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free, and free of any added sugar, artificial colors, or flavors. My favorite bar, if you're looking for a suggestion of a flavor to check out, is the peanut butter chocolate. It is divine. Tastes really good. If you want to try RX Bar at a discount, got an offer for you. Go to rxbar.com slash manliness and use promo code manliness at checkout. And you're going to get 25% off your first order. That's right, 25% off. rxbar.com slash manliness, promo code manliness for 25% off your first order. Also by Squarespace. Take it from me for someone who's built a few websites. If you don't know how to code, it can be a big pain in the butt. You'll probably end up breaking your website more than you would want to. And then, you know, hiring a designer can cost a lot of money if you don't have the scratch for that. Great solution 
mentioned is Squarespace. With Squarespace, you can get a great looking website up in minutes with just a few clicks, just point and click and drag. It's that easy. Got a lot of templates created by world-class designers to choose from. You can start a, a site to showcase your work if you're a photographer, publish a blog or content, or even start an e-commerce store and sell products. Customize everything from the look and feel to settings and products, and it's all optimized for mobile right out of the box. And they got 24-7 customer support. So if you do run into a problem, you can get in touch with someone and get it fixed fast. And best of all, there's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. A dream is just a great idea that doesn't have a website yet, so make it a reality with Squarespace to get a free trial. Go to squarespace.com, and when you're ready to start, use the code MANLINESS at checkout to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Again, squarespace.com for a free trial. Offer code MANLINESS to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And now back to the show. Yeah, there, and, and this is one of those areas of timing that is often beyond our control, and it's it's pretty alarming. So we talked a little bit about school start times and, and how much that has an effect on literally whether a kid is going to graduate from high school or not. And, and obviously, the difference in life outcomes between a high school graduate and someone who's not a high school graduate is vast. But one of the most alarming pieces of research that I uncovered was from uh, Yale University, and what it showed is this. Imagine you take two people, okay, let's take, we'll use you and me, okay, Brett and Dan. We're going to say you and I graduated from college. Let's say we graduated from the same college, but the only difference is that you graduated in a recession, you graduated in a boom time, and I graduated in a recession, okay? So maybe we're five years apart, but the circumstances into which we launched our career were different, again, through no fault of my own, of our own. You graduated in a boom time, I graduated in a recession, well, this research from Yale shows that that, now not surprisingly, you're probably going to earn more your first year because the economy is stronger. I don't think that's a shocker to anybody. I think what's a shocker is that that difference shows up in people's wages 20 years later. So you graduate from college and in, you're in 22. When you're in your early 40s, you might still be out earning me only because you graduated, you began your career at a better and more, more auspicious moment. That's just one of the dramatic ways that beginnings can, can affect us, that beginnings can often matter to the end. And it's one of those situations where it's not like, hey, I can, you know, the other situation you mentioned where it's, oh, I'll go to my boss and explain that I'm a night owl. It's like, what do you do in that kind of circumstance? That's a case where we need to reckon with the, basically the unfairness of people starting at different points. So and what what can are there any ideas of interventions you can do for that? Let's say you graduated in 2008, 2009. I graduated I graduated from law school in 09 and that's when there was just this bloodbath in the legal field. There's firms yeah. just laying things out. It was like my the uh, the dean when she gave the uh, commencement speech. It was like so depressing. It was just like we know it's a tough time to graduate and even my parents they're like that was the most depressing commencement speech I ever heard in my entire life. Wow. But I mean, what do you what do you do? Uh, are there any ideas of how we can counter that? Um, I think what you have to do is you, you have to make it, you have to make that kind of situation, not your problem, but, but essentially everybody's problem. And there, there's actually some interesting research from MBA programs about that. So, so, so somebody who graduates, somebody who gets an MBA in a down year versus an up year, first of all, someone who gets an MBA in an up year is going to likely out earn over the course of his or her lifetime, someone who graduates in a down year. What's also interesting is that the people who graduate in a in a down year, those people are they do become CEOs from once they graduate, once they get their MBA eventually after they get their MBA degree, but they become CEOs of smaller firms. I mean, so it's pure happenstance. So what do you do in that situation to get to your question? I, you know, I, I think that it requires a a more of a kind of a group solution. So let's let's take this. At, at some level, let's take 2008 as an example. At some level, that is akin to a natural disaster to me. And so when there's an earthquake or something like that, we don't say, oh, sorry, bad luck, earthquake, nothing you can do about that. We say, hey, wait a second, that's unfair. They, they had an earthquake, no one else had an earthquake. We're gonna provide some loans, we're gonna provide some kind of assistance. So what I think is an idea in that case is that if the unemployment rate goes above a certain level, national unemployment rate or local unemployment rate is above a certain level in college graduation or, or business school graduation or law school graduation or whatever, then I think it should trigger perhaps some emergency funds or some uh, loan payback programs so that people who, through no fault of their own, they've done everything right, they've gone to school, they've gotten good grades, and just through circumstance have started their career in a, in a downturn, they shouldn't be necessarily disadvantaged on that. It hurts all of us when those people suffer. And you see a little bit, I'll give you an example of this. You see this a little bit in medicine 
where you had, um, for a long time in medicine, you had what was called the July effect. The July effect is when new residents started in teaching hospitals. So they, they, they leave medical school in June and they start their residency in July and they're taking care of patients. These are people who are a month out of medical school and lo and behold, there were a lot of problems with that. Like people dying and getting sick because they're treated by people who are just at the beginning of their career as a physician. And so what the, what the met teaching hospitals did is say, okay, wait a second. We can't just say, oh, that's just bad luck for those patients who are dying. What they did is they say, let's start together. Let's make this more of a collective solution. So instead of having the, the doctors treat the patients individually, they became part of teams. They had greater monitoring. And so I think that when people have, through no fault of their own, a bad beginning, we as a society, as a matter of fairness, have to take collective action. But the other thing is it's good for all of us. Like, you know, it's good for me if you're not, if you're earning a decent living. But what we don't do is we don't recognize how much these starts matter significantly to outcomes even two decades later. Right. Okay. So if it's a, if it's a bad start because of no fault of your own, because of just bad timing, group solution. But if it's a bad start based on, you know, you're just, you didn't do well, that's, that's when you leverage things like temporal landmarks and say, I'm going to get a exactly. fresh start. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Precisely. Perfect. Let's talk about the midpoint. Right. Uh, I think, you know, it's too, it's the new year. Everyone sets goals the new year. They're always really excited. You have that dopamine hitting your brain. It feels good. It, this is the, this is the year everything changes. And then about, I mean, I mean, even like in the middle of January, the motivation fizzles. What, what's, what's going on there whenever we reach a midpoint with a goal or some task where that drive just seems like it just goes away. Yeah, that's a, it's another great question. And it's, it's very characteristic of midpoints. What happens when we hit the mid, midpoints are weird in that two very different things can happen when we reach a midpoint. Sometimes they bring us down. Other times they fire us up. So if you look at middle age, there's this whole you know, notion of a midlife crisis, which turns out not to be true at all. But there is this kind of midlife sag where people are generally happy in their 20s and 30s. They start to dip a little bit in their 40s. By their early 50s, they're at the bottom. And then in their late 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, they start rising back up again. And they're actually surprisingly, they're surprisingly happy. You see it sometimes in terms of people's compliance with certain kinds of tasks, that they're very compliant at the beginning and at the end, but they fade in the middle. On the other hand, there's also some really good evidence about uh, uh, in, in teams, where if you look at group projects, we have this notion that when people engage in a group project, they start and they follow this linear progress from the beginning to the end. And what Connie Gersick, who was at UCLA and now is at Yale, has found is that that's not how it is at all. Basically, what happens is that during the first half of a pro first part of a project, people don't do anything. They posture, they waste time, and it's really only at the exact midpoint that they look up and say, oh my God, we've squandered half of our time, we have to get going. And so, um, so the midpoint has these two different effects. So what can you do about it? I, I think there are a couple of things. Number one is that you have to recognize that there are midpoints, something that was completely a mystery to me until I started doing this research. I never even thought about midpoints. The second thing is that you do have a choice about when you hit a midpoint, you can say, oh no, or you can say, uh-oh. And you're better off saying, uh-oh. And one of the good ways to say, uh-oh, is to imagine that at the midpoint, you're a little bit behind. There's some really interesting evidence from the NBA, big data analysis of, I think, 20,000 or so NBA games that showed that at halftime, a team that is ahead at halftime is more likely to win the game, which makes sense because they have more points. I mean, it's not you know, complicated math. But there's, the exception is, is that teams that are down by one point at halftime are actually more likely to win than teams that are up by one point. There's something about being a little bit behind that is galvanizing. So recognize midpoints, use them to wake up rather than roll over, and then imagine you're a little bit behind. And that's a, that's a way to use a midpoint as a spark rather than let it bring you down. I think that's what happened last night with the Rose Bowl with the uh, the, <laughs> the soon my my Sooners in the in Georgia. They were Georgia was like behind or they tied it at halftime, and then they just came out yeah. and just decimated. Well, like, you know what, what's interesting is it's funny you said that because I, I watched that game and I was thinking about that and I was and they had an interview with the the freshman quarterback at Georgia after the game who was talking about what was going on at halftime 
and how they were behind. And he kept saying, well, we're a fourth quarter team. We're a fourth quarter team. So it is, it, it is pretty interesting. And again, with sports, what we have is we have these very clearly delineated midpoints, halftime, or at least in like basketball, football, and things like that. But in other kinds of projects, we often don't. But if we have a beginning and we have a deadline, there is obviously a midpoint. And what Connie Gersick found, weirdly, in looking at a lot of these team projects is that you give a team 34 days to do something, they don't really get started until day 17. You give a team 11 days to do something, they don't get started until day six. So the more we think about our conscious of midpoints, the more we can use them, um, do a little bit better than the Sooners did in the Rose Bowl. Right, right. So, I mean, students can take advantage of this. Um, You know, you might have a deadline for a paper that's, you know, months away, but like create your own artificial deadline. That will create an artificial midpoint for you to have that uh uh-oh moment to get started. So you don't have to worry about turning your paper the last minute. Great idea. I like that. All right, so we talked about midpoints. What about endings? So we talked about the beginning, talked about midpoints. How do endings influence, you know, the outcome of of an event? Yeah, well, endings have a huge effect on our behavior, and I I think in a pretty interesting way. So there are multiple things that endings do. One of the things that they do is they, they can galvanize us to kick a little harder. So there's some fascinating research from Adam Alter at NYU, Hal Hirschfield at UCLA, about the age at which people are likely to run their first marathon. And it turns out that the most common age at which people are likely to run a first marathon is age 29, which is kind of a weird age, right? 29, where did that come from? And then you start unpacking it and you realize, well, wait a second, people who are 29 are twice as likely to run a first marathon as people who are 28 and people who are 30. Okay, that's kind of weird. Like there's not much of a physiological difference between 29-year-olds and 28-year-olds, between 29-year-olds and 30-year-olds. What's going on? Then you realize, hey, people are likely to run marathons at age 39, age 49, age 59. And so this, this artificial marker of a decade, when we get to the end of it, getting to the end of something can, can focus our attention. It can increase our motivation. And it can also spark a, a, a pretty interesting search for meaning. So one thing the endings do is they get us to kick a little harder, get us to um, pursue meaning more uh, robustly. Gotcha. And you also talk about, we typically remember things on by how they ended. And uh, you, the famous colonoscopy oh, yeah. example. Yeah. Talk about that one. The famous colonoscopy, because I love talking about colonoscopies. In fact... Uh, yeah, yeah, who doesn't? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, there's some, there's some interesting um, research. If you really want to go deep in colonoscopies, no pun intended, there's some interesting research on, um, for those of your, your, your listeners who are 50 and older, do not get a colonoscopy in the afternoon. Afternoon colonoscopies find half as many polyps as morning colonoscopies. I mean, it's terrifying. So, but anyway, but, but there, is a, there is, as you said, a famous piece of research in social psychology from Daniel Kahneman, Barbara Fredrickson on colonoscopies that we, we found that a colonoscopy that, was, that lasted a long time was seen as less uncomfortable than a colonoscopy that lasted a short amount of time, but that had a painful end. And, uh, they, and that phenomenon in behavioral economics is known as duration neglect. That is, we don't focus so much on the duration of an event, but often focus on, on how it ends. There's some other interesting evidence of that. I mean, really cool, st- interesting stuff about you know, how we look at people, the lives that somebody led. So somebody who was a jerk for most of their life, but suddenly became a good guy his final year and then died, is often remembered as well as someone who was a good guy most of his life, but became a jerk in his last year. That is, that ending has this disproportionate effect on how we, how we remember things. You see it anecdotally in something like Yelp reviews. I mean, it's just, a, a, you know, you want to kill 15 minutes, go on Yelp, look at restaurant reviews, and you'll see a disproportionate number of them evaluate the restaurant by what happened at the end of the meal. They gave me a check and it was wrong and they were jerks about it. They gave me a free dessert. Woohoo! You know, oh, I, lo- I left my keys and they ran after me in the parking lot to retrieve my keys. I love this place. So, um, so it's, I think it's really important in our personal encounters and in our professional encounters uh, that we're conscious of endings and, and, and try to get endings to end on a positive, I mean, not, not only on a positive note, but in a way that, that elevates. Uh, human beings prefer endings that elevate. We prefer rising sequences to declining sequences. And being conscious and intentional about that can improve our interactions. 
Gotcha. So we've been talking a lot about uh, timing on the individual level, a little bit of group level, but let's talk more about uh, you know timing of a group. Because that seems, I don't know, like you said, we talked about earlier, people think about the how of group dynamics, the what of group dynamics, but we never think about the when. Everyone's got their own timing or their perception of, of how the timing of, of an activity or a task that they're trying to accomplish as a group. How, uh, how can we, how do we sync each other up whenever we're working on a, a task together? Yeah, there are certain, um, there are certain kinds of endeavors where we want to be synchronized with other people. And I looked at that by looking at, uh, some lunch deliverers in Mumbai, India, by looking at choirs, by looking at rowing teams, and, and there are some rules to how groups synchronize. One of them is, is that groups synchronize better when they have a very clear boss. So if you look at something like choirs, choirs have a, you know, a chorus master who stands in the front, who is the, clearly the person who everybody looks to and is in charge. And that seems to have a foster greater synchronization. If you look at rowing, Rowing teams have a coxswain. The person, that person is not even holding an oar, but he or she is an essential part of that team because that person is in charge of synchronization. So having a boss, uh, people end up synchronizing better when they have a sense of belonging, when they feel, uh, which is one reason why very effectively synced teams, groups have sometimes sort of secret language, gestures. Uh, there's some interesting research on touch that, that one piece of research shows that if you simply watch NBA that they simply watch NBA games at the beginning of the season, looked at how many, how often players were touching each other, high fives, low fives, chest bumps, whatever, that that ended up being a fairly strong predictor of whether the team was going to succeed because those groups seem to be synced up. And also, um, you know, having a sense of purpose and mission helps synchronization too. So some really interesting things about, and, and, and I think that, for me, the interesting part about the synchronization research is how much synchronizing with others makes us feel good and do good. There is something about being in sync with others that is different, uh, that, is, that brings us to a higher level of satisfaction, that is somehow innately human. I love it. Yeah, you talk. I love the example you talk about, and I'll let people buy the book so they can read this. But the Navy SEALs and why they carry logs and the power of log carrying. Did yeah. you have that? In there was that another. That's yeah, a different. That that's a, that, but I'm, it's the same principle. It's the exact same. It's the exact same principle. I, I did something a little bit more tender when talking about talk about about choirs. Uh, if you look at like everybody knows, physical exercise is incredibly good for you, for your body, for your soul, for your heart, whatever. Like you're crazy if you don't exercise. Choral sinking. If you look at the research on choral singing, not just singing, but singing in groups, singing in groups is pretty much as good for you as physical exercise. That's awesome. So we should sing. So next time you're at the baseball game and they're singing, take me out the ball game, instead of rolling your eyes, you should sing. I always sing, take me out to the ball game. It's sacrilegious. It's sacrilegious right. not to. Exactly. Well, Daniel, this has been a great conversation. There's a lot more we could talk about. Where can people go to learn more about the book and uh, your work? Well, you can find the book. Uh, it's called When, The Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing at any bookstore, online or offline. I also have a website, which is danpink, D-A-N-P-I-N-K dot com. Dan Pink, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. My guest today was Daniel Pink. He is the author of the book, When, The Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Also check out his site, danpink.com, where you can find more information about the rest of his work. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash when, where you can find links to resources, where you can delve deeper into this topic. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. If you enjoy the podcast, I've gotten something out of it. I'd appreciate it if you take one minute to give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Helps out a lot. And if you've done that already, thank you. Please share the show with your friends and family. Word of mouth is how this show grows and the more the merry around here. As always, thank you for your continued support. And until next time, this is Brett McKay telling you to stay manly.